Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Doug Scott. Uh, I'm sure several of you are probably tired of listening to me talk about this topic of branded content, but uh, thank you for coming out to the uh, what I believe to be the last session in the uh, Branded Entertainment Summit here at MIPTV 2011. Um, I'm, I'm really actually very excited about uh, this panel specifically. Uh, when we were planning this two-day summit, uh, I felt it very important to uh, kick, the, kick the summit off with a sort of a, a basic uh, 101 of, of branded content, as our uh, CEO, Miles Young, defined it yesterday. Uh, and uh, sort of I wanted to end the session with uh, almost a, a branded content 401. Uh, taking us into really the art of the deal. Uh, and what we have up here uh, is, is representative of uh, all aspects of the deal outside of the, uh, the, dis the distributor. Uh, so I'll, I'll really jump right into it uh, because the, the knowledge that these four individuals have about how to get deals done in this space, uh, not only in North America, but in the UK as well as uh, the rest of the world, uh, I think is, is really valuable as we all embark upon this uh, new space called branded content. Uh, so uh, in terms of brief introductions, uh, all the way down uh, at the end to my left is uh, Chantal Ricards. Uh, Chantal is head of programming branded content at MEC in London. Uh, she comes out of UK TV, which was a network of channels owned by the BBC Worldwide. Uh, there, she focused on uh, developing lifestyle channels, inc including UK TV Style, UK TV Food, UK TV Gardens. Uh, was responsible for a joint venture between the supermarket chain Sainsbury's and Carlton TV. Uh, and recently has worked on projects, uh, which I'm sure we'll hear about, Britain's Best Brain, Meals and Moments on C5, uh, DJ Hero on MySpace, and the technology of business on BBC World News. So thank you for joining us, Chantal. Uh, to her right is Ben Silverman, uh, founder and CEO of Electus, and uh, probably next to uh, Bobby Friedman, one of the uh, uh, most uh, influential people in this industry, only because Bobby has a few years on you. <laughs> um, ben is, uh, is, is really push the envelope in terms of this branded content space, uh, uh, going back to uh, the early days uh, when, when we were all talking about this uh, with such shows as uh, Bravo's Blowout, uh, The Restaurant, which was probably one of the first client-supplied, brand-funded programs out there uh, that was done with uh, Interpublic Group. And uh, most recently, and, and what I find uh, really intriguing and I want to really get to understand more, uh, with where Electus is positioned in the space, structuring deals with talent such as Will Arnett and Jason Bateman um, in, with Dum Dum, uh, responsible for Orbit's Dirty Shorts, and uh, Sofia Vergara uh, of Modern Family, as well as America Ferrara. So uh, really the talent side of the industry, partnering with a uh, you know, production legend and uh, distribution uh, expert like Ben, uh, and really servicing brands in, in a very unique way. Uh, to his right is uh, Bobby Friedman, uh, president of media and entertainment at Radical Media, which is part of Fremantle. And uh, for those of you that uh, don't know Radical, Radical is, uh, I would say, probably one of the more diversified uh, production companies in the space, from commercial production to feature film and documentary production, uh, television production, uh, John came in with his uh, passion for music, <clears throat> getting into the live music space, and really they've been responsible for shows such as Grey Goose's Iconoclast, Nike's, Battle, uh, Nike's Battlegrounds, uh, and uh, what is it, Ironic Iconic America, which was Tommy Hilfiger's uh, series. Uh, you know, Bobby has a, uh, a storied past from uh, president and managing partner of Classic Media, uh, who owned uh, Harvey and Golden Books Entertainment, as well as Casper the Friendly Ghost. Uh, he was co-chairman in charge of worldwide theatrical marketing, president of New Line Television, president of AOL, and uh, in the early days, founder of MTV. Is that correct? One of the co-founders? I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> that goes back uh, way long. And lastly, uh, uh, to, to my left, is uh, Kristen Van Cott and... Uh, 
what, what I find very interesting about Kristen is she's one of two brands who actually has a stand right now on the floor uh, where she is uh, selling her, uh, her contents. And as uh, Vice President of Creative Development at Skechers Entertainment, uh, Kristen has launched or is getting ready to launch a direct-to-DVD movie, Twinkle Toes, and has had uh, tremendous success with Zevo 3 in the children's space with Nick Tunes. So, uh, you know, welcome and, and thank you for joining me for this last session. Um, you know, to, to kick it off, uh, Chantal, the recent, recently in the UK, uh, there's been a, I guess, a, a lift that has taken place from a product integration standpoint, which uh, is, is probably a move in the right direction in terms of branded content or advertising supplied content starting to may, hopefully being the next iteration of, of uh, what broadcasters in that space will start to look at. Uh, yeah. are, you, are you finding more clients are interested in the integration space and subsequently in the content creation space? I think definitely um, that's happening. Uh, the product placement laws have changed in, in the UK and around Europe over the last six weeks. So outside the children's television space, you can pretty much put products, as long as they're editorially justified, into programming now, which is terrific. And the effect, the overall effect, is that people want, brands want more and more to be in branded content, because now they can actually not only own the show, but they can actually put their products inside it too, again, as long as it's editorially justified. So. The, the creation of the program becomes more interesting in a way because you can actually work on getting the, uh, the product inside the show right from the word go. And that's going to have a big, big uplift effect on the whole of um, uh, branded content in the UK. And, and, and is, there, is there any further impact that that's having across Europe with some of the other countries where regulations have slowed that process? I think well, they have been slow in the past, but they're picking up speed all the time. So, I mean, the European directive is changing and people are pushing the barriers all the time. And a lot of this has come about, you know, because the channels haven't been making as much money. There has been a recession pretty, pretty badly over uh, Europe in the last uh, three or four years. And so the channels have been pushing the regulators as hard as they possibly can. So these, the regulations are changing and that's all for the best for the brand. So, Ben, you spent a lot of time in, in your, the early part of your career uh, in London, uh, really in the format area. You know, how do you see that regulation and that lift, uh, you know, sort of giving or an opening into, into these, some of these branded formats that people are talking about? And, you know, are we going to move in that direction very rapidly, similar to what, we've, what you've achieved in the United States with some of these brand partnerships on these uh, client supply programs in that space? Well, it always felt a little hypocritical that uh, America would never allow the New York Yankees to put a logo on their jersey, but I can't tell you whether I'm watching the Emirates play Etihad or what the teams are. So I was always surprised by where the lines were drawn, especially knowing how much sport actually hit young people and was a four-quadrant marketing vehicle versus entertainment. And also the fact that the regulations existed in prime time and in broadcast, but not in digital and internet. And with the digital delivery systems transforming how people consume television and enabling the fast forward, freeze framing, or uh, time shifting, it made the main funding mechanism of television irrelevant. And television was still and will continue to be a place where programs are made that do have a lot of public service requirement and public service remit, but if we want those to continue to be funded, we have to engage the biggest supporter of that system, which is the advertisers who want to be tied to that content. So I think it should hopefully help make uh, you know, traditional free-to-air ad-supplied uh, networks sustainable. And, uh, and continue to be able to serve advertisers uh, with big audience reach and connected to content they care about, always never compromising. I liked your reference to where it's editorially supported, you know, interrupting or disrupting, which is what commercials do now. I can't think of anything more disruptive or interruptive to content than a commercial. So uh, the idea that people lament some of the integration uh, you know, need to pay attention to the whole picture around it. Right. And <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, are they not using a 
an icon of sorts on the network now where there is brand integration that's taking yeah, place? Yeah, the, the, there's the letter P will come up for about three seconds at the beginning of the program to identify the program as having product placement inside it. And then that disappears and then I think it comes up again at the end of the show. At the end of the show. So if yeah. you miss the beginning of the show or the end of the show, you basically <laughs> have no idea whether there's product placement or not. <laughs> Pretty much. But it would make the highest rated network in America the P network. <laughs> <laughs> as well as probably the most profitable. <laughs> Bobby, the, the, the creative process, I mean, you guys, uh, you know, between you and Ben, very much at the forefront of this, of this brand-funded space. You know, sort of take us through how this process starts, because there's been a lot of discussions. We held elevator pitches, which were highly successful, uh, in some cases with production companies and brands, and in other cases, not so much. You know, how do you guys approach that creative process when you're first being introduced to a brand and subsequently within your own development uh, group at Radical? Sure. I mean, you know, I'm scared to death. This is a very fragile process that is going on right now. Um, there are a lot of people that think of branded content as product placement or, you know, purely product integration. To be perfectly frank, we think of ourselves as storytellers. And we like to tell good stories. And we like to integrate the DNA of a brand into those stories. Um, one of the things that was attractive to me about going to Radical is that our legacy was in the commercial production business which was basically a business that was about really understanding our partners' brands to make their commercials on a non-exclusive basis, I might, I might add. And it was, it, it was an interesting process. And if you don't do it well, um, a couple things will happen. Uh, number one, you won't get picked up if it's a television show at a network or if it's a content initiative. It won't really move forward. So I think the challenge going forward in terms of that creative process is understanding a whole array of brands. One the partner brand um, and the expectations that it sets up. Uh, two, understanding that your true client is the audience. Um, it's really not the consumer brand up front um, for a whole array of reasons. And three is really understanding the brand where that content will live. You know, there's sort of an irony right now. We talk about the content development process. There are probably in America and soon to be globally probably 80, just using basic cable as a metaphor for the content market, 80 networks that really matter, meaning they have 60, 70, 80, and in some cases, 90 million homes. Um, they started as targeted networks, which is sort of the irony, as opposed to the broadcast networks. And we're living in this world right now, they're broad-based. So there are four women's networks. So when you create a piece of content, we really make sure that we understand what are the expectations of that brand. Um, that network or that end user or wherever this content may end up living. Um, and I think that's probably key. Um, there are challenges um, because you want really to have an endemic brand sort of work with the content that you're doing. You, so, so the expectations really have to, have to work. And I do think if done correctly, brands can add value, if you will, to the storytelling. You know, we work on a lot of projects um, where the content itself is probably better off as a result of the brand. And we don't try to hide the fact that we're doing branded content. Um, that's sort of a disrespectful uh, operating mode. Um, we don't do it subliminally. We put it right out there. Not that dissimilar to the old days, speaking of MTV, where we told our young adults that everything we were doing on MTV was selling a piece of product. We had a video. Thank God it was paid for by someone else, sort of the early days of branded content, that would sell a record that would sell an exclusive T-shirt only available on MTV. So I think respect for the audience is really um, what we try to practice. It doesn't always mean that the content is necessarily successful, but at least it sets up a, a, a modus operandi that we think works. And MTV got so smart that if you didn't pay, they basically pixelated out your logo. Without a doubt. No <laughs> question. So, Kristen, coming, coming back to this idea of, of, brands, of, of, of a brand's value to storytelling. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys, Skechers Entertainment, uh, with your property, was, was that born out of the, the audience and what that audience for that shoe was really interested in, who your target, target market was? Or was, was it something that just evolved in terms of overall positioning? Well, interestingly enough, I, I'd love to be able to say that it was a strategic decision based on our audience and our demographics, how this came to be. But we, we entered branded content quite by accident. I mean, being in the kids' space as opposed to what you guys have been talking about up till this point anyway. Um, 
we had a, uh, a need to communicate to kids um, the value proposition or the feature of a shoe, simply. And to do that, we created small comic book characters that were putting comic books that were put in the shoe box. And, you know, to give you an example, our very first character was called Cool Breeze, and he was to tell little kids that the shoes they were going to put on their feet or that they should have uh, pumped air into the shoes and cooled their feet. And we put these in a comic book, uh, in a comic book, and then in a shoe box. And we happened to send out 20 million shoe boxes to kids every year. And the next thing you knew, kids were coming into the stores saying, you know, kids today assume if you've got a comic book, there's a video game. If there's a video game, there's a TV show. If there's a TV show, there's a webisode, and on and on. And the owner of our company, who's a 71-year-old guy, decided to make animated TV commercials, and. They, we had such an enormous lift in selling of this particular product that he said, I want a Saturday morning TV show. And, you know, it's not really Saturday morning TV anymore, but nonetheless, we, I come from the entertainment industry, so I had more of a purist view of how this needed to be done. And we found, you know, real animation people and the best writers because we have the benefit of a budget. We self-funded and we made this TV show, but very consciously, because it's in the TV space, um, made sure there was no product placement, made sure there was no uh, branding. And the strange thing, we didn't think we were making branded entertainment, but we quickly became branded, branded entertainment. Sure. And are now um, really um, putting our arms around it. And, you know, we found difficulty in the distribution space, uh, in kids particularly, not because there's product that they can point to, but because the networks have so much control in what you have to give them to play in their space. And so we've changed our strategy. We've gone to direct to DVD, and we're setting up retail models with big retailers because we have those relationships. So we are now in the branded entertainment space, and we're looking at it more the way that Rob described it and Ben described it with a strategic mindset where we initially just wanted to make entertainment, which sold because, you know, it, it, people ask, well, what does it take? Well, as always, it takes great creative. And if you have great creative, people are going to watch it. Distributing it is the problem. And how, how is the series doing on Nicktoons? We were this year surprising, I think, more to Nick than anybody. Um, first or second rated throughout the year. The, the ratings were through the roof. They surprised everybody, but I sit here today not knowing if we'll get a call for a second season, which again goes back to the distribution problem um, that we are now finding ways around and are finding ways or looking for ways to distribute digitally, to find other avenues, retail models um, to get it out there because particularly in kids, there's a limited uh, you know, playing field to play on. Right. Possibly going over to the hub? Well, you know, the hub is, uh, we, we've spent much time, many uh, meetings with the hub, and they share similarly, a similar philosophy, but what I think we've all uh, come to realize, or at least between October and, and now in April, and I mentioned this to the Rob at the beginning of, of uh, sitting down, the definition of branded content is different depending on who you talk to, no and it's changing from MIP to MIP, you know, where, who you should be talking to and how the hub is doing it versus how Skechers is doing it versus how Skechers Entertainment or how anybody is doing it is a, a, a moving target right. right now. So, Ben, I want to go back for, to something Kristen just said regarding the challenges that a branded entertainment property has in getting distribution, because as you walk in, Right? Media sales is saying, oh, here's a brand. Right? Either give me incremental money. And Chantal, we're coming right to you next on this question. So uh, <laughs> representing the media on this panel. Right? And, and you've had a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of success in crafting these deals as entertainment deals, right? Where the brand is coming in tow, but it's entertainment first. And I think that that's one of the common messages that people have heard over the past two days. You know, Maybe you can help me, help us as an industry better understand what is the best approach when you have a brand either co-funding or fully funding a project, 
to really enable yourself to get the distribution and get programmers and distributors to truly understand that you know the direction and, and the goal that the brand has is really in the best interest and the same interest as the distributor. Well, th there's a couple of elements to it. One is you want the network invested um, so that they treat it the same way they treat their other properties in terms of promotion and support. So if you just come in and say, we'll fund it, take it for free, you end up being ghettoized on their schedule. Uh, in terms of how you can operate without the um, partner from the advertising side overpaying for the privilege because if they normally can cherry pick ideas uh, late but have to pay premium for that cherry picking uh, through either an upfront process or a scatter process, you know, there's somewhere in the middle that the market's moving and everyone wants control in, in this, which is a real difficult part of it. You know, the, the media franchises want control, the, the distribution franchises want control, the creative um, you know, voices want control, the, the advertising constituents themselves want control. So how you kind of share control for everyone's benefit, well, without burdening the projects with so much uh, financial investment that their success has to be measured at a different level is still, you know, difficult. What, what we've done is always been just very transparent that uh, yes, this is a great property for you uh, on the advertising or media buying side. Um, we'd love to work with you, but we both need to recognize that um, the network is going to need to still be paid in their normal route, which is through uh, advertising revenue, and they value their time at a certain level, and we're going to have to calculate and build a formula that acknowledges that the, their time is worth money. That's their franchise. And additionally, their creative heads have to buy in as if it's similar to uh, whatever programming had come or emanated from that creative partner. And, uh, and I totally agree with you. I think it, it's a little over whacked on the distribution side in terms of uh, perceived value in a 80, 90 channel world and the ability to maybe blink on this side of the table as well now. And on the other side is um, perceived value of just a checkbook. checkbook. Uh, you kind of need all elements to fire. And The Biggest Loser, I think, was, was a great example of that, which was a show that um, did you know, really well with the audience and with a specific audience, um, but had brands endemic to it because at the time the network was a little nervous about uh, doing that kind of show and thinking it may have been a little soft for them and so was comfortable assuaging some of their risk w with a marketing partner and then in success everyone got to go on a, a ride together. So there, there's a lot of that kind of you know, conversation and compromise that needs to take place. And when, and when you have a format like that that's, that's successful um, you know, obviously you're taking to a market like this and starting to sell it in the territories, but do, do you then step back with the integration opportunities and come up with a separate strategy that in essence is being embedded into that format that's being sold to those territories well, as, until as an the approach? In, you know, until the deregulation uh, happened, we were unable to do things on screen. Um, what we did uh, was more connected to the shows off screen from a licensing, merchandising, and partnership with a uh, supermarket or with a gym company or, or with uh, companies that made sense where it would live off the screen and maybe those companies would then buy advertisement in the programming. But the acceleration of digital delivery, which we just call TiVo in America, um, you know, is, is really transformed how those commercials are consumed. So this deregulation uh, needed to happen, and, um, and I think the opportunity is there. But brands um, really do operate, even the global ones, on a local level. So you know, Unilever's Axe is called Lynx in, in the UK, even the brand titles. So finding the ways to create efficiency, I think that's going to be 
once this starts to kind of catch steam, that's going to be the next phase of real, real opportunity is building some efficiencies because who wants to be a millionaire is the same in every market and a phone company and uh, is going to want to be near it in every market and, uh, and there are other examples of that and we still haven't seen that efficiency. We're just starting to see it in their own models, whether it's Ford rolling out one of their first global models this year and whether, you know, so I think all that's going to be really interesting as we get more and more global coupled with, with local adaptation. Chantal, going back to this question about, you know, the difficulty with the branded entertainment label on a program, how, how, much, how much does media play into it? I mean, can you really buy your way onto a network? No, and nor should you. I mean, I think what you want to give to a channel is what the channel wants. And this thing about control, <coughs> as far as I'm concerned, the channel has to have control, because if it doesn't work for the channel, it doesn't work for anyone. The brand absolutely has influence. But in terms of control, the only control a brand has got is to be able to walk away from the table. And that's what I make sure that they realize absolutely from the get-go, because otherwise it's going to be a disaster. You have to give the channel what they want. The relationship between all the parties has to be symbiotic, not parasitic. And that's incredibly important, and everybody needs to buy into that at, at the beginning. And we've all, we all want to create a show that everybody wants to watch, because then everybody wins. Yep. Uh, so it's not a question of bulldozing your way into a channel with a great big bag of swag courtesy of you know the the world's largest media group that I work for and trying to beat up the channel commissioners because it's simply not going to happen a you'll put their backs up and b you'll end up with a, a show that's run by committee that certainly doesn't achieve what you want it to achieve on behalf of the brand so but I mean I have been a channel director so and I have been a producer and director so I can see sort of every side of this this um, triangle or octagon or whatever it may be. Uh, and, I, and I understand the difficulties from every side, but as far as I'm concerned, the channel absolutely has to contr have control over what they broadcast. Bobby, you're moving, are you moving in excitement? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm a little nervous now. Be, I, I mean, look, no one has come to this place happily. I mean, if it were up to the old days, either the buyers of channels or the media companies, they would love to go in with Irwin's big stick and say, I'm going to give you an extra $10 million. Give me the above the brand classification called XYZ Presents This Show. This concept of doing branded content right is tough. It's becoming a creative enterprise, which it really never was. And it's making it more difficult. And if it weren't for brands saying, I want to be involved in branded content, the market wouldn't be going there. If there weren't an opportunity for companies to go in with brands and their dollars and their agencies and say, I'd like to hold on to some of these rights, Mr. Network, and my leverage is I'm walking in with an advertiser, this business probably would not exist the way it's growing. So I think for all of the good reasons, it's going that way with a lot of people kicking and screaming. Yet it's always nice to have that extra media clout when you do go in, which is why I think at the end of the day, it will continue to be a collaborative process with media companies, with creative agencies who are sort of the, the holders of the brand or the brand police, as you will. So I think the great news is, sort of like the studio system, none of them are going away, which is great. We will all play extremely well in the sandbox. Um, but there are only two people left who have cash. Um, it's advertisers and it's consumers. Um, so in the old days, those network executives, of which we've all, at least at this side, played the role of network executive who are incented for getting a highly rated show are going to have to figure out this business um, because there's not enough money in the marketplace to program 24 hours a day times 110 channels. It just doesn't exist. Um, so, so no matter what, this is here to stay. Um, the fragility in this is where it's going to live, and I think that's a big question. I, I mean, just to add to what uh, he's saying, I, I think from the brand perspective, however, the part that hasn't been figured out is, you know, if, if you take doing your branded entertainment content strictly out of your ad budget, you are st you've got production that's at a higher cost than it would be if you were making spots and dots and 30 seconds and 15s if you're making a full-length program. You've then got the media buy. 
that you may or may not have already had in place. If you have it in place, to your point, they're looking for uh, you know, incremental. an incremental yeah. spend. And then you've got to, uh, you've got, they want licensing off the back. And I understand all that, but I don't think yet that the channels or the networks are, are treating branded entertainment with the respect that we have to actually make the money back. There is an ROI for this to be able to continue, for us to be able to make great content, for you know people to continue to want to be in the space. I can see, our company can see on a 30 second ad the next Monday in our own retail stores a lift in, in, in you know, spend and, and sales. We've had 26 episodes on nine to 11 times a week and actually sales declined because we had to take off our, we took off the advertising because the money has to go one or the other. Right. So I think one of the biggest challenges here is really finding out how financially everybody can come out in a place that makes sense to make good content, that the channels you know, are picking stuff that they genu genuinely want to run because it's good content, but with some you know, consciousness to the fact that the brand actually can't just keep writing checks without there being some way that the business makes sense. And I, in, in our world, it hasn't been figured out yet. Um, I think Skechers is taking a risk, uh, it continues to take a risk and is enjoying it, but you know, coming to every one of these MIPS and, and looking for the buyers is, is difficult because it's like, not only, I, in some cases, you'll, they'll, the spend that they want is equal to the licensing fee over a long period. You can even see where the money might even out, yep. not even make money. But in a lot of cases, it's like, give me a million euros and um, we're going to give you 15000 uh, an episode with uh, translation fees taken out of it. And so basically, you're out a million plus. And, and we're not seeing yet the direct relationship between, and we didn't get into it specifically to sell more shoes. We actually got into it to go into the entertainment business and have a licensing business. But if they're taking from the licensing piece of the pie too, what's, what, what's the point, you know, other than it's fun to make shows? Ben, what's it going to take to get respect from, a, from branded entertainment? I mean, you, you've, you've, you've produced hits, you've programmed hits, You've, you've, you know, you've licensed hits relative to, to Ugly Betty, The Office, right? And there is that question of, you know, is it going to take a branded entertainment hit to totally change people's perception? Well, I think there have been branded entertainment hits, and then it kind of, like, Survivor was ad-supplied, American Idol was ad-supplied, and uh, the restaurant was ad-supplied, and cut to season two, and the producer was told, no, you're, not, you're out of that business now, but thank you so much for giving us the hit without us having to take a risk. And, um, you know, it's, it's just continually evolving, and I think Bobby's point that the media um, franchises on behalf of, of the brands do uh, need to um, say where it's important that uh, the content they support gets supported, and I think that does happen in a lot of ways, even if it's not pure branded entertainment, but is something that they are connected to or really like. And you look at something like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade or something, um, you know, in, in that vein or shows that have more support maybe at a more mid-level rating because they're delivering something specifically for an advertiser. Um, it, the online space and the digital space, which we haven't really touched upon, is, is where I see a tremendous amount of opportunity because it's a little bit more the, in the birth of television. It's the birth of a new media. Yep. And, uh, and in that world, there's a lot more openness and willingness because the digital players um, are doing more and more in video. The consumer is consuming more and more video through digital access. And uh, the CPMs are so much lower that the online portals want to access bigger budget and are willing to partner and create and support content in a more profound way. So 
a lot of the work we've been doing in this space lately has been online. And, uh, and some of the uh, stuff we've done with Wrigley and Jason Bateman and Will Arnett and with Denny's and Sarah Silverman and David Koechner and, and others um, existed on uh, College Humor, existed on YouTube, existed uh, in different platforms that um, were very willing and good partners and created an opportunity for a lot of earned media, yep. which is, you know, I think something that mm -hmm. makes you feel better as the brand. Uh, the investment is smaller, um, and the opportunity to see something take off virally is, is really big. But then on the other side for us as a program maker and an intellectual property uh, investor, the opportunity for those things to then travel abroad or into DVD or into other formats is, is a lot smaller than off of the network uh, platform. But I think a lot of us also are working in this market because we believe in the over the top experience and the three screen experience and think that brands are gonna have even more of a role to play in that three screen experience as their new uh, platforms emerging that don't have the entrenched legacy of a siloed uh, buying and selling system, which is how uh, television is operated. You sell to one door and a different door sells the property. Uh, inside these new franchises, you're communicating to the person uh, typically in charge of both of those uh, functions. I think it's worth saying that actually a piece of content should be, you know, this phrase liquid content. Yeah, it should be everything in every space, in every shape, in every form. Yep. And once you've got a piece of content, it can be TV. The transcripts can turn into a book. It can be a podcast. It can be an app. It can be a piece of radio. It can be so many different things. And coming from the, from the media perspective where we are telling our brands how to get their message out there, to offer them lots and lots of different touch points is actually how you make uh, branded content work. Because those different touch points, getting to different audiences in different ways, engage the audience so much more critically with the message that the brand is trying to put across, that that's actually how the return on investment comes across. You, you know, so I would business. never suggest that a brand just does a piece of telly, or just does a, a book, or just does a piece of radio. It's got to be all those things. You know, you know, it's a perfect business model when you think about it. The, the title of this is Art of the Deal. You have a consumer product company that really wants to sell deodorant or whatever, or shoes. Um, you have a production entity that really wants to create either IP or to create ancillary opportunities, which is fine. And it's interesting when those companies sometimes want to share with brands Many of the larger branded companies don't even know where to deposit the check when you give them a piece of the back end. So, so, but the basics, if you will, or the foundation of this business really do make sense if we do not mess it up. Um, because you have very interested parties in each of um, the, the areas where you can monetize the business. So it's, it's really a good place. It, it's for us to screw up. So going back to your, your idea of, of, of liquid content or the fluid fluidness of our industry. Yeah. A lot of talk about transmedia. Mm -hmm. There's transmedia storytelling. There's transmedia, right, which some, I think, are confusing with cross-platform, right? Um, do, do you see that idea of fluidity, almost a transmedia application where story can live in different formats Absolutely. on different platforms? And to that end, because I, I agree with you that that really is the true, truest definition of transmedia, do you, do you think that anybody's doing that well for brands? Yeah, I think people are doing it well. I mean, we've got lots of different projects on the go um, in the UK and around the world, and we make sure that there are di different touch points for all of them. So, I mean, we, we uh, fund through our uh, client Specsavers, which is um, a spectacle, uh, an opticians um, company based in the UK and the Nordics and in Australia. Uh, they fund um, the book show on Channel 4, the TV book club, which is a, a three-year deal. We do two series a year for them. And, we may, and that is going all the way from television through to Facebook, through to groups, through to podcasts, through to the... Uh, artists on the show tweeting about what they're doing, 
Um, it, we are in, I think, five, we've got posters in five, or book displays in 500 shops in the UK. Five of the books featured in the last series have been in the top 10 most sold books in the UK. We're in 2,000 libraries across the UK. I mean, there are so many different places that you can touch the Specsavers brand. We've got, I think, a million and a half stickers on the books that we have pre-selected for the show. So every, and also when the publishers actually use uh, their own advertising, they are also obliged to put our logo onto the, their own publicity material too. So you are absolutely spreading that message as far and as wide as you can. And, and it works. It absolutely works. All the metrics have pushed it up. Absolutely works. So will you explain to Bobby what a book is? That's because I'm young. I read it online. Uh, so is reading bad for your eyes? No. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> I, I think that, that, that something Chantal you know, says off of what I said be begs the, the point that as brands, we're looking for the, the likes of you guys to be the, the, the keepers of the toolbox to give us the tools. You know, brands are used to advertising, you know, simply. This is a product, this is who we think our demographic is. You tell us where, how, okay, go. The, I think we're looking for the experts in, in the space to connect all the dots. And it sounds like from your end that your, your, your channel's actually involved where, I don't know if we have that in the States as much, where it's still a uh, dark, vast, scary well, you, place. You know, I think it, it's funny that you say that, because in the States, um, clearly, I believe, within the next five years, all of the networks as we know them will probably have the capabilities, if you will, to do what we talk about doing. And I know, you know, Ben, when you were at NBC, you were sort of the leader in that, and that was obviously very new to that network. I can tell you that I don't think it's enough to just have cross-marketing capabilities at these networks or these media companies. Um, we believe, and, and we've put our money where our mouth is, is that you have to develop a property or an idea, you have to actually stay on board and produce and make that idea, and then in many cases, particularly when it comes to advertisers, be in the distribution business. Um, domestically, we were in the distribution business um, because the alignment of whatever the property is with the location um, on air is really important. And internationally, we weren't in that business, um, which is one of the reasons why we allied with Fremantle five years ago. I call it a precondition, um, like a medical precondition, um, where they distribute us internationally because they were in the lifestyle business of understanding where a brand could live as the world was beginning to change internationally. Today, this wheel of fortune that we're all talking about, the days of traditional media hubs are over. I mean, we take a look at a property, if it comes in the digital door, it may go out the content door. If it comes in the television door, as you know, particularly in the kids' business, there's not very much money in the kids' programming business. It better come out that merchandising door. That's right. Otherwise, you're dead. So I think that process, if you will, of understanding what we all talk about as 360 or branded content, um, it's okay to talk about it, but you better have the capabilities to really do that process. It doesn't mean that that process works. And we have a lot of failures as well as successes, but you better have the infrastructure uh, to do that. So, you know, digital, hot topic, everything's digital. The acceleration rate of new devices, the iPad, right? I guess the iPad 2 is, is projected to reach some number, I saw 50 million units, right. uh, you know, shortly. Um, you have billions of apps being downloaded. I mean, you have TVs that are coming out with apps on the screen. Is the idea of network distribution or cable distribution in jeopardy? And does that change the game for the brand altogether to the point that brand owns real estate now on the desktop, on the pad top, on the monitor? And, you know, it, it really is about networks, if you will, or their studios producing content and, and really more about the content that consumers want when they want it. Well, you know, from our standpoint, there are, there are four boxes that come into the home. You know, there's the computer, there's the radio, there's the television, and there's the telephone. You have a even, radio? Though, yeah, even though it's not a landline telephone, it's a telephone. And the fact that they exist and the fact that you can multipurpose content across all of them 
does not by any means suggest that the consumer wants to use that medium for certain kinds of content. And I think that's what's going on right now in our business. Clearly, there will be episodic, 40% of viewing is time shifting. There'll be episodic programming on digital. A few people are putting their feet in the water. We've begun to put our feet in the water. But I can tell you, there is no money in episodic programming on television, on digital at this point. There are a few examples of it. Lisa Kudrow's done something with Lexus, which was a great branded thing, which ended up being monetized on television after the fact. So they will all exist. The question is, is where is the consumer going to develop and consume that media? And I think that's, that's changing over time. You know, I, I was talking um, at a school a while ago, and I asked everyone to raise their hand who watched television. The whole room raised their hand. These are young adults, probably 25 years old, certainly in the key best demo. What school are they 25 years old? Columbia Business School. Oh, okay, thank <laughs> <Sorry>. you. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you'd get me. I was no, trying. But, yeah. but of that group, interestingly enough, <laughs> probably 40% <laughs> of it watched it on their computer. So what, how they consume this media is going to change. That's why it really does, content is king, and it will continue to be king. I think brands may be the, the prince mm -hmm. <laughs> in the castle, um, but content will still, at least for the foreseeable future, still be the king of the, the court. Ben, on that point, I mean, Denny's huge success online, right? Great, great talent, more talent surrounding that series from what I hear. I mean, does that migrate over to, to this platform that's, you know, in the home uh, on one of these boxes? Yeah, and I think people are consuming it that way. I, I loved what you were saying about what you did with the uh, books series across all these touch points, because I think, the, you know, in America they may be closing that wall, but gosh, did Specsavers help Channel 4's ratings, I bet, by hitting all those marketing platforms that wouldn't have been touched by them because their budget would never have allowed them themselves to invest and make that kind of creative deal. And they don't have the time to do that around an individual project as much as they do across their slate. And so I think that's another thing people need to recognize is that you know, everyone's bringing something to the table. When we launched Restaurant and Blowout, American Express was a phenomenal partner in tapping into their distribution platform. They spoke to card members. I remember being on the back of bills as a promotion uh, to, to the show and being inside a radio program that the network couldn't afford at the time against a genre that was risky, which was the docu-soap, now the most dominant genre on television. So, you, you know, there needs to be also more recognition of what you're doing in retail mm -hmm. and in store. It needs to be quantified as you're saying, yeah, you want to you know, a million dollars from me, but I'm giving you 10 million in, in marketing touch points, which is, you know, saving you on your budget and making us the number one or number two show. And I just think all those learnings are so new that a big thing that I don't see playing at a prominent level, because it all has to happen after the fact, is where research plays in this as well, and where the, uh, Traditional brands have, have really relied on research as a tool to um, make decisions. And because some of this is so new and so spread and so all over the place, the risk needs to be taken up front if you want to be a player for the long haul and own your own success like you're doing with Skechers Entertainment and like you're doing like Bobby and I are, are doing. But then we need measurements to demonstrate why this is good business and can then go scale it. Um, and I think that that's another part that, you know, I think is just being developed because there's the practical of, oh, wow, we sold less by making the show than buying advertising, but there may be a 10x on your brand uplift. Mm -hmm. um, and what's that worth and, and, and all of those things. And that's still so nascent that it, it's, you know, it's still easier to point to the Super Bowl ad uh, as driving a specific uh, point of action than some other uh, investments. And we need to start to have the tools to demonstrate why what we're all doing is so much more uh, efficient or valuable to all, all parties concerned. But I, I will tell you, I, I don't think any of the platforms are going away. I don't think anyone in this room has to be nervous. I mean, broadcast television is here. It's going to be used differently as an event medium. 
Um, people are going to use digital to talk about it. Google, obviously, uh, an entire category to address the clutter in the world that we all live in, advertised on the Super Bowl last year. What an irony. Um, none of these things are going away. Just the question of how you use them, I think, is, is really going to change and how you package them. Just adding to the distribution thing that we were talking about, that we did a series for Children's ITV in the UK that was paid for by Morrison's, or a big supermarket chain um, in the UK. And they were able to advertise that show in all their supermarkets across the UK. So we had posters um, throughout the duration of the first series, um, a footfall of 11 million people a week going into that supermarket seeing those posters. Now, in theory, when you've got that sort of ability to help drive an audience to the show, that's the sort of thing that I use in my negotiation with the channel to say, I'm going to bring you this extra promotion. What are you going to bring me? And I try and do those deals up front to make sure that I'm going to get you know, an extra load of promos to, to, to push the show, um, accreditation on their website, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, it should be a partnership. It's going back to this whole idea of being symbiotic. It should be absolutely a partnership between the brand and the channel and so that it should just work for everybody. And it shouldn't be scary. It's interesting because <clears throat> it's, it, when we got into our partnership with Nickelodeon, we showed up with all of that. And they didn't want it. They didn't know what to do with it. I mean, it, and it may have a lot to do with being in the children's space, but you know, we have... 300 of our own retail stores. We had 20 million shoe boxes to put stuff in to get them to kids in a year. I mean, and they just didn't know what to do with it, and it just panicked them to how to use it. And I think, you know, we've educated each other a bit, and in the future it might be different, but it's, it's, it's the brand value you can add and the, add, the added value you can add to promoting a show is tremendous yeah. if you're creative about it. Did, did Hilfiger promote uh, Iconic Ironic in, in, in their stores? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we did a really integrated program where we actually teased the show in their stores you know, as part of their live event strategy. We actually um, um, used, and the network was very open to us promoting you know, this prime time sort of yeah. a special. You know, I think one of the challenges, you know, because you mentioned about Nickelodeon, that gets to why you really need to have exactly the right brand fit. Because right. if you think about Nickelodeon, it's we versus they, kids versus adults. Right. You know, unlike something like PBS, which is a different kind right. of a kids brand, which is maybe not quite as relevant today. So, so yeah. I, I think, because they are such, you know, they're very neurotic about being the brand mm -hmm. police, that the brand has to completely align to right. tie in. Um, and, and in this case, with, with Bravo, it really was a complete alignment. Right. Right. Uh, any questions? Right up there. Hi there, my name is Mark Friedman. Um, this session was great, really. I was impressed. Uh, but I have a small comment, and uh, maybe you could, you, could, you could refer to it. I see that actually the brands are giving are the ones who have the knowledge and have the competence in doing 360 content. And they're actually pulling uh, producers, medium, TV stations to go into 360 because from my perspective, uh, mostly the TV stations and the big producers are, or they don't have competence, or they don't have time, or they don't really want to do it because it's lots of work, little money, and no, no real revenue, and nobody knows how to use it. And I see brands as the real ones who are pulling all the industry into 360 and doing it really well. Like the example of the previous presentation with Coca-Cola and Yahoo, where Coca-Cola did a really great job with it. So I, I guess the question there is, you know, are producers and distributors capable of developing 360 marketing plans and, and really taking a property out cross-channel, or is it the brand that really, uh, you know, is that part of that role that's defining the brand's um, value proposition in these deals? Well, I mean, from my perspective, that's the relationship between the brand and the brand's agency. Yep. Specifically, the media agency, obviously with the help of the ad agency too, um, where applicable. Because we should be informing them about how the world is moving, how they can pro promote themselves across many, many, many different media. And that's the, that is the role of the media agent. That's what we should be doing. People who sell shoes, 
know how to sell shoes incredibly well. There are very few people like Kristen who absolutely understands the whole entertainment space but works for a brand. I mean, it's really rare. It's fantastic, but it's incredibly rare. That's where actually the experts, people like me inside the agencies, need to be training the brands and telling the brand managers and the marketing managers what is out there, quite simply. That's our role. Well, uh, you know, speaking just on the producer side, I can tell you that we really integrate in the agency folks and the brand folks. I mean, this Unilever issue, we were talking about links, which was Axe in the United States. Um, there were a lot of writing sessions because it was sort of a, really in the scripted reality vein where we had some of the agency creative people actually working on scripting in the same way that you would with a showrunner in a more traditional show. So I think you're right. I think it's a real process about how it gets done. It does vary in our experience from brand to brand. Um, but everything in that development process of branded content has to be done with really understanding the expectations of that brand or the content's not going to work anyway. Um, so you're right to be concerned, um, but I do think that there is a best of breed group that's trying uh, to make that work. I, and I, I think that to add to that, I think uh, one of the things that Chantal said, I don't think there's a lot of people, it may be you know, just the people who have come to these sessions or to, to understand branded entertainment, you almost have had to live in multiple worlds. You had to be a network person, a consumer products person, uh, because to, to, to understand the full circle of how this ties together is almost impossible if you go up one vertical of one type of position. And it's almost, I think it would be great at, from the agency side, what would be, have been fantastic for us is if you know, the old account executive actually becomes an in-house person with you for the life of that. Because to understand the brand, the way you would in a traditional agency model, you need that person to educate the company at large. Because the person on the inside, I I'm one person from entertainment in a consumer company, and it is so hard to move that ship. And, and the education process is very difficult. So Ben, you've done something interesting at Electus. You, you brought in an ad executive, Laura Caracoli, to provide that insight for your programs that you're out there developing. I mean, is 360 capability sort of, you know, the, the, the new view of, of a production company where you, you really need to have marketing expertise and knowledge sitting at that table internally versus externally just embracing the agency? Yeah, we, we absolutely do uh, think that. And, you know, we're trying to kind of bring a lot of the functionality in-house so that we have someone who can communicate around media evaluation, someone who can communicate around brand metrics, someone who can communicate around, uh, you know, brand concern. And then on the other side, a series of strong uh, A-list talent and creators who know how to tell the best stories in the world. And, uh, and then also we brought in the head of um, YouTube content <coughs> partnerships and the head of Yahoo Studios so that we can really understand and, and deliver on the digital side. So we're trying to bring technology, uh, advertising, and storytelling from a content-centric perspective into one hub that can then work with everyone um, at the table. I do agree with your headline, though. You know. Uh, the fact is the networks and big producers are worried about cannibalization of their big ticket programs mm -hmm. and uh, correctly so uh, when you know it's been famously said a number of times you know trading uh, you know broadcast dollars for digital pennies is a, is a current reality still uh, when I look at a back end check of the office and see the valuations versus uh, who's viewed the show uh, in a uh, broadcast world, what that's compensated for versus a digital world. Now that's the same exact piece of content. What I think we're all trying to bring to it is how we activate that content in these other environments in unique ways. How we utilize Facebook to create social conversation using characters and licenses and elements of the show to drive back. How we create shorter form content that's not directly from the show repurposed, but connected to the show so that the storytelling can continue when the show's in repeat to drive back to when the show comes back. So that's still an art form that um, is not yet 
fully scaled and fu fully in, in place. So the initial instinct from everybody is, I don't want to even touch it, as opposed to I want to I want to figure out how to tap into it in the service of the consumer because they're the ones demanding it, you know. And that and that's who I think if if a, a broadcaster, a, a network, or a big uh, producer ignores what the consumer really wants, uh, they're going to end up getting uh, punished down the road. Couldn't agree with you more. Other questions? Doug. Hello. It's me. Um, hi, I'm uh, Patu from Ogilvy. Um, <laughs> and um, first of all, a compliment and that link to a question. Um, been coming here for six years and um, was always a little challenged by the fact that your industry refer to these brands as these uh, wallets with, um, well, you know, just uh, quite dumb wallets, let's say. They were just there to be used to kind of really fund great content. And I have to say at this MIP, it's kind of really changed a lot in your recognition, actually, particularly on this channel, to also realize that brands have actually great audiences. Um, you know, just imagine how many Unilever packaging and how many clients and customers Shangri-La hotels and British Airways actually welcomes every day. So, you know, networks are looking for audiences, but just imagine how many audiences or viewers actually brands already have. So I, th I think that's a really great comment from Ben and Bob, and thank you very much for that. But linked to that, hence a question. I mean, the tension is still really clear on, uh, in terms of really figuring out how brands can really contribute to this. So what, from a brand world, from an agency world, are you expecting that brands can actually do to really help this forward? Because um, you guys are working hard, but what you need our industry to do um, to really create that understanding and that opportunity with your traditional, let's say, partners. Bobby, you want to take that? <laughs> what can we as creative agencies, as media agencies, I would say as PR agencies, you know, I mean, li li talent agencies aside, there, there's f four or five key marketing agencies that sit around these tables from an integrated ad team, whether it's at American Express or at Unilever. Everybody's got branded entertainment groups or somebody that is now assigned to branded entertainment. How, how can we more effectively work with companies like yours or Electus to uh, you know, to, to move the needle in the right direction and further this, this art called branded content. I, listen, I, I think this is going to evolve, this business. And um, uh, toward that end, I, just like I think there will always be broadcast television, I do think that there will be all areas of this media pie that we're, that we're living with. I do believe at the end of the day that agencies and holding companies, um, as will media companies, probably spend a little bit more time on this because their clients are demanding it. And I think that they will probably get more involved in some of the things that we're currently doing. Um, I don't think you can own all the talent in the world. I think you have to create an infrastructure. We have uh, an infrastructure at Radical, uh, but we have an open architecture so that we can bring in that kind of talent uh, that's necessary for the kinds of initiatives we do. I'm not nervous um, that the agencies will take away our business, um, but I do believe that they will begin to play a deeper role. I never really understood why agencies in general weren't in some of the production sides of this business. There's clearly a lot to go around, and I would love it if, the, if, if, if this category that we're calling branded content became a bigger chunk, whether it's of the media companies, you know, on the Irwin side or on the creative agency side just using your home as an example. Um, I think together we really have to build this category. Um, and, you know, we're never going to be able to scale. Um, there's a, enough business to go around. So from our standpoint, to answer your question, I do think that, you know, everyone's going to have to get their hands a little bit more dirty and the, and the current model and, uh, of, in the agency business will evolve. Not completely, yep. um, but will evolve. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Bolton Brown. I'm a composer and a musician. And I'm very interested in what you said about how Specsavers was able to promote a book club. Do you have any examples of how uh, a company would be able to promote a musical event? I'm, uh, I'm heading a very large worldwide 
uh, event uh, called Music Olympia. It involves both TV, music, and digital uh, platforms. And I was very interested in how sonic branding fits into this, especially as uh, none of you have said anything about the music end of this. So just interested in your thoughts here. Anybody like to take on the... I, can, I, I don't know if this answers your exact question, but I can tell you that what we've come to realize in even just making the content that we're making is one of the best areas for recouping money is associated with music and sharing in the music co-production with music entities um, as, you know, writers, co-publishers. And it, it wasn't an area that we knew anything about. It was actually kind of forced on us. And just, just coincidentally, because one of the children of the founder of our company uh, in-laws in the music business. And we have gotten involved with uh, sponsoring music events and, um, and putting uh, groups of people there who are twittering about the event and it relates back to the brand which talks about the show and it's this whole, you know, circle of where music can help where we've had trouble in broadcast. And, and from a profit standpoint, it so far has been one of our biggest profit centers. So approaching maybe, I don't know who the conduit would be, I don't know if it's the agency or who the conduit would be between the, the music uh, entity and the brand, but I think those partnerships, whether it's music, whether it's you know any kind of uh, art, is starting to be a place where um, you, you, it's an added value that makes you that drives a profit center and then drives a partnership that opens up, you know, that full other we're, area to places to market. We're getting approached more and more by, yeah. by music companies and by yeah. bands yeah. To, to form partnerships with yeah. them. I mean, you know, Take That and, and Samsung sure. is a recent one. Yeah. I mean, not that we've done that, but I mean, it is a recent one in the UK, but that's happening more and more. Yeah. We've had, you know, it's interesting, when we think about who our clients are, in addition to consumers, we think about agencies, we think about clients, we think about networks, and we think about talent. Um, there is no record business today. I mean, I grew up at MTV. It doesn't, it literally doesn't exist. My kids have never bought a CD, and they're in college. I mean, everything is digitally driven. But when I talk about talent, particularly in the music business, as being, or talent, musical guests, there are so many great new things that you can do in music. And that's really what's being driven in part by technology. Not just the simple right. technology of Apple and how you download music, but the idea, we had worked on a Bon Jovi film that was really, talk about multi-platform, that was launched theatrically, um, that then went out as part of what the world had used to call a box set. Um, so I think the ways and the clever things that you can do now in music, we just, for example, uh, did the last performance of Rent that we put out theatrically. There was no economics. It, it didn't exist in the world before there was digital distribution of film. So I think that that really is gonna be so key and so exciting for music. It's just gonna be very, very different. From the label standpoint, the labels that have recognized this early and resized their business, mm -hmm. like Warner's, um, which, you know, New Line, when I was at Warner's, we saw what was going on. They were a little bit ahead of the curve and said, just the business is sized differently from an economic standpoint. But this is an exciting time for music. I wouldn't be frightened by it, uh, but you just have to be very clever, I think, about the distribution needs. So, well, can I say one last thing? Sure. One last thing on that that I, I should have mentioned is we have been approached by a group that has made a deal with universal uh, traditional DVD distribution um, entity, and they're actually consuming visual content from a visual but also audio and musical content perspective. So we have a director DVD children's property coming out, and they want it. They want the distribution rights of the DVD, but for the music and visual uh, or uh, you know rights because of the platforms of iTunes or the new com coming iTunes competitors to um, where m music distribution and, and DVD distribution were separate. There are groups that are pulling it together more and more quickly to exploit both. And it's just changing s a little slowly, but, yeah. but every day. So with that, we've run out of time. We'll end it on a high note. Uh, thank you all for attending this uh, final session of the uh, Branded Entertainment Summit, and enjoy the rest of your MIP TV. Thank you, panelists. Thanks, Doug. Bye. Bye.